Should be uh, some familiar passages. But well, Romans one. Now, now we uh, just as a, as a side note. This week we had an amazing declaration from the Supreme Court, an amazing ruling, and they ruled against abortion. And I uh, pray all of us here would be on the same page with that. That uh, murder, no matter where your location is, is murder. And uh, I know it, it hits really close up to home for me. It's pretty harsh. And uh, yeah, I wish it was that way 30 years ago, but it wasn't. <clears throat> but out, out of that, you know, I've, and I've always paid attention, and, and, uh, but the last status that, it, that was hit, it was uh, with the page. Every day, 9,278 people on average die in the U.S. On average, 9,278. Considering the population of the U.S., that doesn't seem like a whole lot. But out of that, 3,000 babies were murdered a day. One out of every three people that died was a baby that was aborted. Wow. Pretty profound. And, and what's worse is to think that us as a country would get to that point to where that's normal behavior. And I, I know we've talked about it in your Bible studies, just talking that, that uh, the, 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 the demise of a nation, any nation, when you look back through history, is when, is when sin is normalized. And then eventually sin becomes celebrated and rejoiced over and then if sin is rejoiced over, then what happens to righteousness? It's mocked and ridiculed, and the truth is trampled on. And that's, that's kind of where we are as a country. I mean, praise God for this victory, but if you've not paid attention and saw the backlash from this, it's pretty, pretty bad. Pretty bad. Because this, this, this hits home to a lot of people and a lot of families. If you, if you don't know anybody where this, this stat hits home with, you're living in a cave somewhere, I guess, because it's, it's pretty profound. So in that, I know there's uh, several other rulings that are coming up, that are supposed to be coming about, and, and as such, so is the, the feedback, so is the, the pushback. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get worse and worse and worse. And you know what, the Bible... <laughs> The Bible tells us and it warns us that it's going to come a day when we will be hated. If you stand for righteousness' sake, if you stand for the Word of God, and if you stand for His His truth, you'll be hated. You'll be ridiculed. You'll be mocked. And you'll even be killed. And uh, I think we are pushing more towards that time more than ever before. So in, in Romans, to go off that, Romans 1 and we look to we look to verse six. Kind of gives the directive who who is Romans written to, and it's written to the believers that are in Rome. And he says, verse six, among whom are ye also the called of Christ? To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. It's it's not just be called, it's not just to believe, but you're called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from our God the Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's almost as if Paul put an ending to that phrase. Here's his good beginning, and it's fantastic, and it's wonderful, and he calls them the called of Christ, and they're called to be saints, and then he uh, switches gears a little bit. But I want to move over to verse 16. And this verse ranks true for us today more than it did yesterday, more than it did last week, more than it did a year ago. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is... The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. It's the power of God unto salvation, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is laid out beautifully in 1 Corinthians 15. He came, he lived, he died, was buried, and resurrected three days later, and seen by over 500 people. 
That's the gospel in a nutshell. Boom, 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 boom. There it is. If you don't believe that, then you don't believe the Bible. If you don't believe that, if you have to take off one thing, so well, he didn't really die, well, then join the Muslim crowd because because they did, they think he didn't really die then either, or several other other cults that believe he didn't die then. But that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He came. He lived perfect, sinless life. He died a most horrible death. He was buried three days and three nights. He was in the belly of the earth, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. And then resurrected on that third day, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and seen by over 500 people, then finally ascended up to heaven. And then he's coming back again. That kind of completes the whole picture. So in this, that, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And verse 16 says, I am not ashamed. So what are you going to do if you're not ashamed? Woo! You're going to let it rip, Tater Chip. You're going to let it go. You're going to proclaim it. You're going to let it out there. You're going to tell people about Jesus and not be ashamed of it. And that, that is something that can get you hurt, mocked, ridiculed, and even killed. Just like the Bible tells you so. But what happens if you don't, if you if you hold your lip? No mocking, no ridiculing. It's just gravy. It'd be sad not only to deny Christ, but to deny Christ to someone. So so he says to the Jew first and then the Gentile, verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he's got the just living by faith, and now Paul is switching gears yet again. And you, you have to ask yourself as we read this, why, if, jo if Paul is... And God, and it, this is God's perfect preserved word. If Paul is saying this to Christians, you have to ask why. Why would he warn them of this? Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all. Say all. all. Now, you know, I believe all means all. Right? When it says all, that's what it means. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now we could stop right there. And that, well, that's a true statement, right? That's an absolute true statement. The wrath of God will be revealed. And you say that there's a, the Bible talks several times about the day of His wrath, the day of the Lord, and it's not pretty. We've been studying about it on Wednesday nights for a long time. And it's not going to be pretty for those that do not, do, do not know the Lord and do not obey Him. They said the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And it says, who hold the truth in righteousness. That, that seems like a, uh, an ironic statement, a, uh, a weird thing to say. How can you hold the truth and still be in unrighteousness? How, how, how is it? I can hold the truth and be in unrighteousness. That's what it says, right? They hold the truth in unrighteousness. They say, this, they say it's true. They believe it's true. They hold to it's true. But they, but they have not gone back to where it says in verse 17, for the righteousness of God from faith to faith is written. The just shall live by faith. They can have the truth, know the truth, know it, but yet it not doing the job. It's not, it's the, the truth has not been mixed with faith. It's the, James says, even the demons believe and tremble. What makes us different than a demon? Faith. Faith and believing. Demons who have seen God, you know, they exist in the spiritual realm, you know, maybe sometimes manifest in the physical, but they've they seen God. They have no doubt whatsoever that, that God is true and they know His Son. So what's the difference between us and a demon? Faith. So they, these here, they said they hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of them, of God, is manifest to them. That which may be known of God. 
And it's not, it will be known of God. It's, it's, it may be known of God. It's revealed to them. And if God has revealed himself to them in truth, in righteousness, in holiness, in all those things that it talked about prior in Romans. God revealed himself to them. It says God showed it to them. How do they know the truth? The Bible says you shall know the truth and it shall make you free. And to, to quote the old G.I. Joe, and knowing is half the battle. <laughs> knowing is half the battle. You can know about God. Well, they call it the 18 inches of grace. The knowing up here, you go in the 18 inches to here. The knowing in so much that you know the truth, but it makes a change in you, into your heart, into your mind, body, soul, and spirit that changes the aspect of your life. These, they know the truth. God revealed the truth to them, handed it to them on a silver platter, yet did not result in the faith, the saving faith that changes people. Let's continue on. Verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. And you get that, the invisible things are, cl are clearly seen. You see how that works out? The invisible things are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. No excuse. The invisible things since creation are, are revealed to you. Even the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, it's revealed to you so that you can know it. It's shown right there. All you have to do is grab hold of it and apply it. Don't, let, don't just let it be head knowledge. Let it be heart knowledge. And it says they're without excuse. You know, I, you've, you've heard me say you've got, there's three types of believers. You've got your unbelievers, and you've got your believers. And in the middle, you've got your make-believers. I believe that's, that's what these scriptures are talking about. These are the make-believers. They've never, they have the knowledge. It's been given to them, revealed to them, but it never sunk in. It never changed them. I don't, I don't know if they were ever born again. And it kind of, kind of goes with uh, yeah, let's turn there. Uh, Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. I could get on a, show, a soapbox about Matthew 7. Probably the most twisted scriptures of all the Bible. This generation, that, that their favorite scripture verse, is verse 1. Right? Judge not. They don't even quote the whole thing. They just say, judge not. Well, so how about opening your Bible and read the best rest of those verses and see exactly what it is that they mean? Is this, it, all it's saying is, is well, I'm going to go ahead and read it, just so everybody knows. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. What measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. And the same measure, the same judgment you put out, is going, you're going to be judged the same. Well, here, here's where it changes a little bit. For why beholdest thou the mote in thy brother's eye, and consider not the beam that's in thine own eye? Or how would I say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, the beam is in thine own eye? So it, it makes sense, right? If, if, I smoke, if I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day, and I went to somebody that was smoking half a pack, and said, you shouldn't smoke, it's bad for you, it'll kill you, right? That's hypocritical, right? And that is exactly what this is saying. It doesn't say they don't judge. It says don't judge as a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite when you when you make a judgment. It, and it says, verse 5, Thou hypocrite, what's it saying? First cast the beam out of your own eye. Get rid of the log. Get rid of the plank that's in your eye. Then what? Why? Why would you get that out of your eye? There's a purpose. This is part of being part of the body of Christ. Get the beam out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. What's the point? The point is not to judge in hypocrisy and just point fingers, but the point is you get the sin, get the junk out of your eye, you stop smoking two packs a day, and then help somebody that's smoking half a bag get out of the addiction. That's what it's about. If, if you got the, the, the plank out of your eye, does it still take a judgment to realize somebody's got a speck or a moat? Absolutely. 
you've got to make a judgment call to see that. And that's what it's all about. So, so move, moving over, continue on, chapter 7. That's a little soapbox. I'm off of it now. We'll probably return there sometime or another. But uh, in, in uh, say, chapter tw or verse 21, chapter 7 of Matthew. Matthew 7, 21. Everybody there? Yeah, amen. So it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does what? Doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. I think it's not a coincidence that we were talking about saying songs about those that, you know, they, 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 you know, they, there's no other opportunity for them after you draw your last breath. I'm sorry if you think there is, but there's not. Once you draw your last breath, your time on earth is done and you go on to your judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. That's all there is to it. That's that's uh, kind of gets away from a lot of different things. But it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? What well, could it be in God's will to prophesy? Sure. The, the word means preach. To, to declare the word of God. Have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils? Is it the will of God to cast out devils? It, yeah, it can be. And it said, In thy name have done many wonderful works. Should we do wonderful works in the name of God? Absolutely. Let your good your works be seen among men that they may give glory unto God which is in heaven. Matthew 5. And he says, verse 23, the saddest, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Then I will profess unto you, unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work in iniquity. Well, you see, I, God, I, I did all these things. When we get to heaven, there will be no opportunity to go before God and brag. God, I've done this. And God, I've done this. And God, I've done this. I deserve to be in here. <laughs> no, you don't. The only way that you can get there is not because, hey, I did this in your name. I did this and I'm bragging and I'm boasting. When we get to heaven if, and if our heart is right with God, we will get there and says, I'm here because of your son. And we, we have that awesome sign that somebody donated. Church of Jesus, it says, it's a nice metal sign, right? John 1930, it's finished. The debt has been paid. The, the debt is canceled. It's finished. It's done. And that's what we do when we get to heaven. We say, uh, your son, the one sitting next to you, that's the only reason I made it. No good thing that I could ever do could I have ever done except for your son. Except for your spirit filling me. It was all to you, all glory to you, God. If I dare boast, I will boast in my knowing him. Amen? So back, back to Romans. Rome back to Romans there. And hold tight. There it goes. Verse 20, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. They say, uh, people say, says, well, what about that, that person on the desert island that had never gotten the chance to hear Jesus? That good person. So you know what? The Bible says, Jesus said, Mark 10, there's no, none good, no, not one. None good, no, not one. So that, 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 good, that myth of a good person on a desert island that never got to hear the gospel, it's a myth. Because there's none good, no, not one. And I think a lot of people want to excuse that fact so they don't have to go out and you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel, be obedient, walk in the will of God. But he says, nobody is without excuse. You can see the sun rise and say, wow, there must be a God. You can see a tree in bloom or a bush or a flower. You can look into the eyes of a baby and see, wow, there must be a God. This didn't happen by accident or by chance. It's a, a, an absolute scientific impossibility that nothing can make everything. And they made up that science to say, you know, the, the third law, third by that, third by that, 
thermodynamics. Is nothing can make everything. Everything has to come from something. But God said there was nothing. And then he created everything by his word. So verse 21, because it says, because that when they knew God. So wait a second. What, what does that say? Did, what's, what did they do to God? It says they knew him. Because that when they knew, is that new? Is that is that present tense or is that past tense? Past tense. It says they knew him. They knew him. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful. That's why we should thank God in all things, right? Neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, if you're a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner, your heart is dark already. And I don't, I don't think it can get any darker. But if, but if you come to know God, He changes your heart. He gives you a new heart with new passions, new desires. It says, Their foolish heart was darkened because they, past tense, knew God. God's, God's Word is amazing. Professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. Me and God were like this. Me and God were kind of thing worked out. Me and God, we got a thing going on, you know. Uh, you know, I call it my bro. You know, we we hang out. You know, you know, we hang out. All the all these excuses that you hear. It says they professing them to become that they were wise. They became fools, which means they weren't fools and they, they became fools. But they knew God, and then they didn't know God, and then they, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorrupt, uncorruptible God. Because you know there's in, no sin in God. There's no corruption in God. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Make light into corruptible man. Into four footed beast and creeping things. Which reminds me of of Exodus 32 where they took the golden calf. So we don't know what happened to Moses. We don't know what's going on with that, with all the, the lightning and the thunder and the trumpets and all this stuff going on over here, but uh, uh, we, we need something to worship. Aaron, here's our earrings. <laughs> Make something out of it. we got to have something to worship. So they made it a graven image and worshipped it as God. They took that. Well, that's, that's, that must be what's up here causing all this problem. I'm going to worship it. But in the first, that verse it says, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made unto like corruptible man. Because you know, the, the, the greatest means of idolatry is to look into a mirror. That's nice. Looks good. Worship of self is the greatest form of idolatry. Worship of self. Because all of everything that you want to please comes from worship of self. To have your ears tickled. To be drawn away from the truth. To have your flesh pleased. Be drawn away from the truth. It all starts with pleasing yourself. Worshiping yourself. Making yourself numero uno. Verse 24. Another one of them awful, sad verses in Bible. Wherefore God also gave them up, gave them up, gave them over to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor of their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They changed. Did it, say, did it say that they knew God? It said that they knew the truth? It said that they, they knew God revealed Himself to them. They knew the truth. They took the truth. They twisted it. They formed it and changed it into a lie. Two plus two equals four. That's truth, right? What if I said two plus two equals 4.1? It's not right. It's a lie. There's a hidden half a point in there somewhere or something. It's a lie. So any any small deviation from the truth is a lie. No matter how little, no matter how small. If if uh, if uh, a thief robs, um, steals a million dollars, he's no more a thief than if he stole one dollar. 
right? There's, I know the, the punishment may be greater, but he's still a thief. If you tell a little white lie, you're no more a liar than if you told the greatest liar, whatever. You're still a liar. So in these, they changed the truth of God into a lie. And in so doing, they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. They, were, they committed idolatry. Take the truth. Twist it just a hair to make it comfortable for you. And then you worship and serve the creation rather than the creator. You worship what makes you feel good. What you're comfortable with. And here's where it gets hairy. It may step on some toes. For this, verse 26. For this cause. What cause? Because they changed the truth. Because they worship then committed idolatry. For this cause, God gave them up into vile objections. It says, what does it say in verse 24? God gave them up. And God gave them up. He let them go. Say, so here, here you go. Have at it. This is what you want. I, I revealed my truth to you. I gave you everything you needed. I gave you the opportunity to have faith and trust and hope. What's, what's that uh, saying Paul Washer says? That uh, with one hand, God is offering His grace and mercy and salvation. With the other hand, He's holding back His awful wrath. And one day, He will drop both hands. And there will be no more grace and mercy. And the wrath of God, which we read back in uh, Romans 16, or 15, so this, for this God, for this cause, 26, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their woman did change the natural use unto that which is against nature. The natural human desires and wants. And I think you can, you can make that fit a lot of things, like the, the natural use for a woman to breastfeed their baby. Why, why is the medical society pushed away from that and go, go towards formula? This is the natural use of a woman. This is what God created those things for. And why would you push that away? Go from the natural use to the unnatural use. And then here we have this formula thing like crazy. Sheila made a good point. There's a reason that in Mexico they're not a formula shortage. There's not very many of them use it. They do what's natural. But you, as we know, there's other reasons, other ways that this can be fit. To they, the woman did what was not natural, right? And then verse 27, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of the error, their error, which was meat. They, they got their just desserts. This is what you deserve. God allowed you to continue and do. And, and this is talking, who's this talking about? This is talking about people that said they, they knew the truth and it said that they knew God and did not worship Him as God. Past tense. In, in that, we, we sang that, uh, and it's a wonderful song, and it's a, it's a shame, but Ray Bolts. This, this verse fits Ray Bolts pretty, pretty firmly. He denied to put away the use of a woman to please himself. To go against what was natural to men. Leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one towards another. Now lust is good in no shape, way, shape, or form. And fornication is fornication no matter what. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So I think we can both see what Scripture says plainly. In verse 28, it says, Even that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Retain. What's it mean to retain? I have it, and I'm holding on to it. I'm holding fast to that truth which you give me. I mean, this is precious to me. I love it. I honor it. I cherish it. I'm holding. I'm holding on to it. It says, They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. Which means, which probably... One of the things that led to this denial of the truth is uh, dust on their Bibles. They, they no longer have a desire for more of God and more of His Word. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And God gave them over. 
So God gave them up. God gave them up. And now God gave them over to their own mind. To their own, to their own reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient. To go against the natural use. And then verse 29 is something that, that, that kind of goes away from the last three verses we were talking about, but it, it may hit home for some of those that are listening. Because it says, and there was a, a, a semicolon there, and it goes, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, there's that all word again, all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implicable, unmerciful, that's a pretty long list, isn't it? Uh, have you, is there something in there that you have fit into? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, because a lot of, a lot of people would like to take Romans one and just make it about homosexuality, which it is clearly not. That is a a, a, piece, a piece of it. This is what happens when God gives them up to a reprobate mind. But but there's all these other parts to it. Unrighteousness. I mean, that, that just includes everything, doesn't it? Fornication. Sex outside of marriage. Wickedness. Covetousness. Desiring that which is not yours. Maliciousness. De devising ways to hurt people. Full of envy. Murder. That kind of goes along with the abortion issue. Debate. Deceit. Malignity. Whisperers. Backbiters. That's gospers, backbiters, haters. Haters of God. Because any of those things there is not out of love of God. If you don't have the love of God, then you have all that's left is the hate of God. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Any kids listening? Son? <laughs> Included in the list. Without understanding, they can't comprehend. You can talk to these people until they're blue in the face. These people that are reprobate. You can talk to them and try and tell them the truth. They're, they can't understand. They can't grasp it. Covenant breakers. Without natural affection. Implicable. They can be blamed. Unmerciful. And in verse 32. Who knowing. Knowing the judgment of God. Knowing the judgment of God. And it goes back to, to what it says. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They know the judgment. Don't care. They just go on. They do whatever pleases them. Whatever makes them happy without taking into account what pleases God. That is no longer on their agenda and it's so far gone. You know, a lot of people would say that these people can never be saved again once God gives them up. And I don't see that in here. You know, I mean, you could, you could take it how you want, but I, I just don't see it here in Scripture. It says, Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things, and watch the such things. We got verse 28, 29, and 30. A list of such things. They who commit such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same things, but they have pleasure in them that do them. They take joy and they take pleasure in seeing people that commit sin. It's like, uh, I don't know, turn on your favorite soap opera. What is the main theme in the whole thing? Sin. Sin, 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 sin. You take pleasure in those things. But they know the judgment of God, which is the most awful thing. And, and I want to go just a couple more scriptures there before we close. It says, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. 
Continuing on, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. Now you can't stop there, although a lot of people would like to. Those make-believing Christians, they will stop there and not go on. Thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. The very same thing that in Matthew 7 he was talking about. So you got a plank in your eye. You have no business telling anybody about their speck. Get the plank out, then help others with their speck. This is what walking in Christ means. Get rid of that so you can do this. He says, but you do, you the judge, you do the same thing. You're, you're, in, the, you're in the list. You're doing the same thing that they're doing. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal? Dost thou steal? Because that would be hypocritical, would it? Thou sayest a man should not commit adultery? Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols? Dost thou commit sacrilege? Because it doesn't make sense. You know, how, how many people have you heard, or you may know, it could be you yourself, that this is why I don't go to church, because there's hypocrites there. It's full of hypocrites. That's not a good thing. It's not something that we should dismiss. In verse 2, back to verse 2. Thou doest the same things, but verse 2, but we are sure the judgment that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do the same, do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. But, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But this is a verse here why I would say that that list from Romans 1 is not a finality. That there are people that can come back from that because it says the goodness of God leadeth thee, which is telling those that you're committing the same thing as this, but it's the goodness of God that leads thee to repentance. What is the goodness of God? The, the greatest act of good that could ever be done on anyone by God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here is the golden opportunity. Don't play the hypocrite. Don't be just like the rest of the world. Don't be like everything you see on TV. Be different because God has offered you the greatest good that we could ever embrace. Here is my greatest good, now be good. Here is my greatest good, be good. Here is everything you need on a silver platter. Here is the truth again. Here is everything you want, everything you need to walk and be godly in Christ Jesus. Now do it. Trust me. Trust me. Lean on me. Put your hope in me. Like, like we said before, if we get up to heaven and said, well, yeah, God, I, you know, that one, I stopped sealing, you know, and, uh, you know, God, I stopped lying, I stopped taking drugs, God, stop smoking. You know, I, I did all these things. I did all this, and God said, uh, depart from me. I never knew. Because the right answer is that no matter what good it is that we can do, we should do that good for the glory of God, by the glory of God, to the glory of God. Because it's all about Him, not about us. When we can look at the cross and say, hey, it's, it's, He said it's finished. He said it's finished. I can depend on that finished work of Christ. I can depend on my God that died for me on the cross, took, upon, took my sin upon Himself, paid the fine by which I am due. And not only covered my sin, but he cast it as far as the east is to the west, making me like him. Know not the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. When's the last time the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the, the love of God, the grace of God caused you to weep? Caused you to or just seeing God working in somebody, just seeing their lives change, it just, it breaks anything, 
hard or any mold around your heart that may have been growing, it, it, it cuts it off. Oh, God, how amazing and how good you are. Forgive me, Lord, for ever going against you in any way, shape, or form. As David said, try me, O Lord. Search my heart. Try my reign. See if there be any wicked way in me that I must serve you forevermore. Now, I would, I would say, read the rest of that chapter. Because it gets gooder and gooder and gooder and better and better and better. It just grows and grows and grows. And, and I, I challenge you, read. it takes uh, about 40 minutes to read the book of Romans in one sitting. The, the context of the book of Romans is the whole book, right? You, you'll miss out on the whole thing if you don't sit and read the whole thing because you can, you can cherry pick things and end up way off course. But I pray that this, this truth today, it doesn't just go over, that it hits right here, that it hits home. It says, I don't want to be on one of those, on that, on that ship, on that, that place where... God would say to me, depart from me, I never knew you. I want to be on the, on, the, on the side of right and good, giving glory to God that says, well done, my good and faithful servant. There's only two choices in the matter. Well done or depart. And I pray we are all on that well done part. Growing and growing ever so close to God, continuously pulling out planks as God reveals them. And then helping every, everyone else. Once you get it out, say, let me share with you how God helped me. Or how I did, how got through that struggle. Let me share with you what God did to me. And don't take any credit for what God's done. Amen.